Welcome. Uh, this afternoon, we are going to be talking about Black history. As part of the Black History and Black Voices series, we're going to be talking about sports and justice. Black activism in sports has a long and powerful history, from Muhammad Ali losing his heavyweight title after refusing to comply with the Vietnam War draft on ethical grounds, to athletes taking a knee and using their collective power to affect change. How has America been shaped by Black sports activists? How, have sports activi how has sports activism changed over time in Minnesota and nationally? These are just a few of the topics that we'll cover today. But as, as usual, we'll begin uh, this afternoon with our land acknowledgement. I wanna begin by recognizing that we are on the ancestral homelands of the Dakota and Ojibwe people and pay my respects to elders past and present. We would like to honor the past, present and going, ongoing efforts of the Dakota and Ojibwe people to steward and care for this land. We'd also like to acknowledge the labor of black enslaved people who lived and worked in Minnesota at one of our sites, historic Fort Snelling, located, located at Bidote. These truths are the foundation of this initiative and its work to provide historical context to events yesterday and a hundred years ago. And now on to our program. I'd like to introduce our guests for this afternoon. First and foremost, we are joined again by Dr. Terry Ann Scott. Dr. Scott is an author and associate professor of American history and director of African American studies at Hood College in Maryland. She's received numerous awards and recognitions for her research, teaching, and community outreach, and is heavily involved in community service and social activism. Our other guest this afternoon is Tony Santa, the president and CEO of the Santa Foundation, which serves the holistic youth development needs of the increasingly diverse Twin Cities metro area. Tony created the foundation in 2003 at the height of his career as a major league soccer player to leverage what he saw as soccer's unique potential to create positive social change for young people. As we begin our work today, I wanna to start with Jackie Robinson, who in 1963 is invited down to Birmingham, Alabama by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King to deliver remarks with regard to the Birmingham campaign in that city. Just a few weeks earlier, Dr. King had acknowledged Jackie Robinson at the Waldorf Astoria during his induction into the Baseball Hall of Fame as a freedom rider before the freedom rides and a senator before the senators. And now here was Jackie Robinson invited by Dr. King to address uh, demonstrators in Birmingham, Alabama. We'll play that for you before we begin our discussion today. I think you realize down here in Birmingham what you mean to us up there in New York. And I don't think that white Americans understand what Birmingham means to all of us throughout this country. And we think about the little kids being tossed from one side of the street to the other by the tremendous force of this hose. And we think about, oh, uh, this picture just sickens me, this big brave policeman down here with his knee on the throat of this lady. And the problem of it is, ladies and gentlemen, is that this same picture of the dogs and of this policeman with his knee in the throat of this lady it's a picture that's being portrayed throughout the world. And I think the conscience of America is beginning to awaken. I think the first steps that were made here by the Birmingham businessmen with Dr. King and the other leaders down here is an indication that perhaps the conscience of Birmingham is beginning to awaken. The only thing that we are demanding is that we be allowed to move ahead just like any other American citizen. So it's a very powerful place for us to begin today as we talk about this in the shadow of the verdict in the Derek Chauvin case last week, uh, the nation in Minnesota being at the epicenter of a national reckoning on race and social justice and the importance that athletics has played in that. In fact, I'd like to read to you from a powerful piece by Dr. Scott from this past summer. History, she wrote, tells us that change has occurred through the persistence of those who work for racial justice. Those athletes who have chosen to use their platforms and stand together with so many others in a long movement for social change, who risk much more for the cause of liberty, of justice, to force a nation to confront, confront its wicked reality and to make the words written in the founding documents apply to all, demonstrate that nothing is impossible. Such a phrase will carry us to the creation of a world of parity, a world where we honor difference and reject injustice, 
a world of possibility. Dr. Scott, let me begin with you because in that piece, you talked about what you call the triple consciousness that often defines the role that African-American athletes have to play in terms of balancing what they do on the field of play and dealing with the realities of race in America. Can you unpack that for the audience this afternoon? Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be sitting here with both of you and, and take on this important topic that as we m most of us have probably noted in listening to Jackie Robinson, much has changed, but much has remained the same. And so there is still some work to be done. So when I talked about this triple consciousness, it stems from, and I'll talk about the origins of the phrase because double consciousness is obviously not mine. It stems from the idea that athletes and black athletes in particular are supposed to choose one consciousness, one identity. And that identity is the identity of entertainer. And anything else suggests that they are stepping outside of their place, acting against the status quo and acting in a way that has historically not been palatable to others. And even today we see that with the kind of criticism that's heaped upon athletes who engage in social justice, who engage in racial justice. So where does that come from? W.E.B. Du Bois, and for those of you who pronounce it Du Bois, let me just make a little side note that he preferred Du Bois as a rejection of the colonialism and the French accent on his name. So Du Bois in 1903, and he had published it in an article previous to this, but in 1903 in uh, Souls of Black Folks, he writes an article called Of Spiritual Strivings. And in that article, he talks about his own double consciousness. He talks about the moment when essentially he realized that he was black when a little girl treated him differently, a white girl treated him differently. And he said, at that moment, I knew essentially that I had two paths I could go down. I could go down one that was nihilistic where I would internalize an idea of being less than because I'm black, or I could go down a path where I would excel in all things and beat everyone in all things. Thank God for all of us, he chose that second path. And he said, on that path, there's a double consciousness. I am both American. And when you are American, you should have access to and you should be brought into the fold of democracy and have rights as other citizens. And he says, and I am also black. And as a black man at the time, and arguably now in many ways, he is denied access to many aspects of democracy. And so he says, how do I reconcile these dual consciousness? Because I don't want to stop being American and I don't want to stop being black. I want to figure out a way to make the two of them work together. And he set out on his life to do that. When I talk about a double consciousness, I'm adding a third identity a third level, and that is of being an athlete, particularly of being a high profile athlete, a lionized person, and the idea that when you are a high profile ex athlete, you should have access to certain things, or you typically do have access to certain things and treatment that other people don't have. But what the world proves to us is that with that triple consciousness of being American, black, and an athlete, um, they are still pushed to choose one identity and to say that you must just be an entertainer. And so black athletes, just because they are famous or in a lionized position, are still functioning in the public sphere as black people. We see constantly black athletes being pulled over or harassed or different things. Robert Ory recently last year, when he talked about the fear that he had of his black sons going outside, his status as an athlete did not buffer him from worrying about his sons being killed by the police because they were black. So the idea is how do you reconcile those identities? And so in the clip that we saw with Jackie Robinson, he reconciles those three identities by using his platform to speak out against racial injustice. Oh, I think you. I think you're still muted. Sorry. Um, such a great point, Dr. Scott. And to that point, Tony, I wonder if any of that resonates with you, this idea of triple consciousness. You were an impact player in um, Major League Soccer. You've been a global ambassador for the game. Um, can you talk about your own experience in kind of navigating these terrains that Dr. Scott speaks about? Um, you know, so much of it resonates. And then, you know, there's also the perspective, you know, the, the fact is that every athlete knows that he has to make a choice or he's being forced to make a choice. And when he does, or she, um, you're really making a choice of, are you willing to give it all up for what's right for the, you know, outside of yourself? Colin Kaepernick did what he thought was right, knowing that he had to destroy his life. It, it, it You really, they're making you choose to give up everything to choose what you believe in. Um, I, I know, like, I remember, you know, being in, in Europe. Um, and in Nuremberg, and 
um, you know, they call hip hop music, black music. And we had a game there and I brought a U.S. national teammate to the, to the club, which I was a VIP at and they liked me because I was a local player and they gave me bottle service and they, you know, and I, and I walked in and, and it was, you know, black music night. And they told me all of a sudden that I couldn't come in because my friend, another U S national team soccer player was too black. Um, and I was like, wait a minute, like same guy, you've been begging me to come to your club for months. And, you know, um, so yes, you experience it when, um, they want you to be special when they want you to be special. And then they want you to be their version of black when they want to be their version of black. And so I think the hardest part is being our version of black, which is being everything and successful and being able to stand up for what's right. So you definitely have to navigate that. Um, and people are forced to kind of make a choice and the sacrifices that, that the athletes that we're going to talk about, um, you know, it, I don't know what to say to, but when you're an athlete and you're on top of the world as doing that, someone like Muhammad Ali, you know, Lou Elcinder, um, and some of these people, and you're willing to risk it all for what you believe in, um, that's a tough choice. And it may not have been for them, but it's hard for a lot of people to give up their God-given rights to be great, to be on the world stage, to have the success that people only dream about um, just for saying they want to be treated equal. You know, what's fascinating about that, Tony, is I think about when uh, Muhammad Ali passed and Robert Lipsky in the New York Times in his uh, uh, obituary for Ali said, Ali later in life became a legend and saw a focus and people forgot about um, his activism. They forgot about it in, in very tangible ways. So the fact that he was willing to give up um, his title and his ability to box in the United States for the stand that he took on the Vietnam War. Um, and that stand of course was motivated by exactly what you talked about, Dr. Scott, this idea that um, as he put it memorably, uh, no uh, Viet Cong ever referred to him um, in a derogatory way that his own countrymen had deferred to him. Uh, Dr. Scott, it's it's interesting for me because you framed that conversation from the summer in terms of the um, lead up to the 1968 Olympics and this proposed boycott that was going to take place. Can you talk about that and kind of frame for us what was happening in that moment? Because I think it connects to this idea that we want to talk about this as an American phenomenon, but as Tony pointed out, because of the history of colonialism, this is a global phenomenon and so, something that Black athletes experience not only in the field of play in the United States but in uh, around the world. Right, absolutely. And uh, I mean, there's a lot to kind of unpack with that because one of the things we can talk about with black athletes and leading up to that 1968 um, questions about the boycott, that's what you're asking about, right? And, and the stances that individuals took is that much of that was informed by people in Africa, Africans taking a stance and pushing for independence from colonial powers. And so there is a, an intellectual conversation that occurs throughout the 1950s, the 1960s, between African activists and African-American activists. And so in leading up to the 1968 Mexico City Olympics and the creation, for instance, of the Olympic Project for Human Rights that was started at San Jose State by Dr. Harry Edwards, who went on to be a professor at Berkeley, the conversation was, what do we do? Do we boycott the Olympics altogether? But as uh, Mr. Senna has pointed out very well, that the achievement of becoming a high impact, a high caliber athlete is a lifelong commitment and is something that is very hard for some people to say, well, I'll just throw that by the wayside. That is an everyday commitment. And so the conversation leading up to that 1968 Olympics was just that. Well, do we boycott? But we've earned this position. So in the end, the decision was do what you feel you need to do in terms of representing the country and demonstrating to the country what's happening. I mean, let's think about this in historical context. What is happening in the 1960s? There are people being beaten by police and pushed down by hoses simply for trying to register to vote. So we have to understand what's happening. People are still being lynched at the time. The Klan is running local governments and killing people. There's structural inequality that is plaguing urban centers at the time. And so in order to take a stance, each person said, well, this is what we're going to individually do. And so when the two men, Carlos and um, Smith, got on the stand here, as we see, and wore that patch, and actually the white man who was a 
uh, an athlete from Australia also wore the patch. You can see the white patch. And he was completely admonished when he went back to Australia for doing that, simply for wearing a patch that acknowledged humanity, essentially. They were stripped of their medals. And they were asked to leave the Olympic Village within 24 hours. And so the Olympic Committee said to them, you will not show any kind of demonstration. But by contrast, I think it was a young Czech gymnast who had also displayed on the stand when she won a medal, a protest in opposition to a country that had invaded her own. And she was not asked to leave the Olympic Village. She was not stripped of her medals. And so even the admonishment at that time became very racialized. So, such a great point, particularly in our contemporary moment. Uh, Dr. Scott, I want to ask you about this, uh, Tony. Tokyo uh, Olympics 2021 have said uh, been very clear about banning protests. What's your thought on that? And, you know, as somebody who played on, an, on, a, on a global stage, um, what message does that send, particularly in light of the history that Dr. Scott just shared with us? I mean, I think, again, you know, you have... You know, we talk about institutionalized, right? This is globally institutionalized, right? Um, you don't have the right to say what's wrong. Um, and they're trying to create an environment and minimize the importance of free speech. Um, and, you know, I think what they're, they're focused in is, is not humanity, not what's right. And it, we do wonder about what we prioritize in this world. And I think at some point we'll talk about how everything, you know, goes back to money in some sense. But, um, you know, I, it's hard. It's really hard what the, what the world should do. And I'm not telling any athlete what to do, but it's hard when a country basically says that I'm not going to listen to any complaints about your human rights, no matter what happens there. Um, and so I don't, I don't agree with, with their statement or their stance. Um, and, I, and I pray and hope that every athlete doesn't have to make a choice, um, that, they, that they do something beforehand. Um, so I don't, I don't agree with it, especially from, you know, those in power. And, and, and that's the hard part is like those in power or with power, like the Olympic Committee or like the country, are the ones that are institutionalized as globally. Um, and so the world's not going to be a better place unless we realize and stop um, trying to control people. No, again, phenomenal point, Tony. Uh, from this perspective, there is no bigger stage than the, the Olympics. Um, and we can talk about that as a platform and how well, how important that moment was. Having said that, um, Dr. Scott, I think about the WNBA, certainly not the same level of visibility as um, the NBA. But when you talk about the courageous stand that um, female athletes like Maya Moore took with regard to police brutality, it was significant. Can you unpack that for us a little bit and talk about um, how important the efforts of these women in particular were and how it's consistent with what we've seen in terms of African-American history in general and the importance of black female activism. Right, absolutely. And the word that I would have used is the one that you just used, courage. That's exactly what um, has really kind of governed their actions. And I think that for those who choose to take a stand, regardless of uh, gender and regardless of the sport that they're playing, for those who choose to take a stand, instead of admonishing them, instead of demonizing them, we have to recognize the sheer courage that is involved in being able to and being willing to have that stand. The WA, the WNBA has been, uh, they've been particular leaders over the past year and a half in the field of speaking up against racial and social injustice. And I love that when I talk about the history of sports and activism, sports historically for various reasons in American history have been male dominated. And so women begin to, are, are part of certain sports, obviously, are in the early 20th century, tennis and other sports, but with people like Wilma Rudolph winning multiple gold medals in 1960 and others, you have more of an entree of women into the sporting world. And so we're continuing to see that. We're continuing to see this blossoming and this engagement of women in sports. And I could go into all of the things as to why, you know, women should be involved in sports and all of the benefits of that. But with that said, then, it brings me particular joy to be able to see what the women of the WNBA are doing and to be able to talk about them, to be able to place them at the forefront of this kind of consciousness of working against, against social injustice. 
Um, there was an image last year that I recall where a number of the women wore white t-shirts with seven bloodied holes in the back to represent the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha. And to be able to don a shirt like that and to go on the court and know that you're opening yourself up to criticism is outstanding. It's incredible. And it creates a conversation around that. And for them to have had media blackout days, for them to have made sure that the league paints Black Lives Matters on the court, that is really much of the triumph that has happened. Maya Moore to say, I'm going to sit out to overturn the wrongful conviction of Jonathan Irons, and then is successful in that endeavor. And then of course, the most beautiful love story of all happens because then they get married. So what a wonderful ending to that. But what these women have been able to do and their male counterparts in some of the other major leagues is to fundamentally change how those leagues do business. And so you have an NFL who hates Colin Kaepernick and then because of the push of women of the NBA, of men of the NFL, and of others, of, of Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, you have a commissioner who then apologizes and said, I was wrong, and now I'm going to do better. And you have Major League Sports who are doing better, who are investing money in economically marginalized communities, who are allowing their athletes and encouraging their athletes to express themselves and their fight for social justice. Thank you, Dr. Scott. You know, Tony, let's pick up on that because there historically that's been viewed as the revolt of the black athlete. And we've seen a backlash against black athletes in particular who've staked out that terrain, that territory. Of course, everyone knows the, the famous story of Jackie Robinson and the bargain that he um, and Branch Rickey make about him not fighting back in that first year um, in order to try to gain traction with this great experiment, which they knew could be fraught with danger. Um, if Jack were to respond in a way, um, certainly the behavior that was exhibited against him invited. What I want to talk to you about in particular, though, is in terms of navigating that space, particularly in our contemporary moment, um, I think back to Trayvon Martin in 2012, the Miami Heat donning hoodies um, in that moment. Uh, when and, and I also think about your work in a certain sense, based on what Dr. Uh, Scott shared with us in the very beginning, the athlete in some sense has is commodified. There's a commodity. There's something of value you offer. To withhold that is a powerful way to um, create change. And yet you've also demonstrated there are other ways to, to use that as a tool to empower communities. Um, can you talk a little bit about other constructive ways that we see um, Black activism or activism among athletes that addresses those issues of inequality? Um. Well, I, you know, I think one is 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 mentoring and sticking up for for other people. Um, you know, I think in in every league, you know, as you get bigger, more powerful, a guy like LeBron, his voice means a lot more. You know, and so when you have the leaders is standing up for the younger players to what's right, I think we've had some great example of Jackie Joyner Kersey of going back to her community, um, and setting up shop and and creating a space for kids. Um, and, and, and giving back in, in that way, you know, leading by, leading, leading by example, you know, I, I would say. So I think, you know, in, in the big picture, you know, we need to, I always say, you know, we're not short on talent, we're short on support. So, you know, you have the, the athletes that, that made it and that are making sure that they're reinvesting in other talent. And, and it's not just financial, but it's showing up. Um, empowering, supporting the next group of leaders, the next young and young men and women that are going to be, you know, the next Jackie Robinson or the next Obama. Um, and you know, we 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 talk about it in sports, but it's really in in every aspect of, of life. Um, you know, if you're if you stick up for your friends, you you're intimidating, right? Um, if you if you're funny, you don't take stuff seriously, right? So at every level, you know your characteristic is amplified and spun into a negative way than your white counterparts. So I, I, I think the best thing when I played with, you know, men of color um, was just to respect me and tell me and give me confidence to be me. And, you know, um, you know, I remember once, you know, when I was in, in Germany and um, it was the team doctor came to me and he said, don't ever let anybody here stop you from being who you are. Because the team is better off with you being a fun, positive person. The team is better off with you working hard and sticking up for yourself. Um, so I think sometimes the best thing we can do for athletes 
and in life. You know, we talk about mentorship, but we really look at sponsorships. Those of us that have the, the relationships, are we walking people into those relationships? Right? Because otherwise, Google teaches you everything. But if we're really not willing to demonstrate and walk and put our reputations on the line um, to give the others a chance um, and really access, because we're talking about access and a lot of opportunities, giving them access, then we're not doing our job as leaders. So fascinating because you're, you're um, I think, connecting to what Dr. Scott shared in the very beginning about that, that third element of this triple consciousness she talks about. And there being an impulse, at, at least for some athletes, to suppress part of their identity in order to be palatable. Um, I think back to the apocryphal story regarding uh, Michael Jordan, um, when people pressed him as to why he didn't take a more visible stand on um, issues of police brutality and racism. And, you know, again, uh, not verified if he actually said this, but the idea was that, you know, Republicans buy sneakers, too. And so Michael was trying to you know, stay in that space. Uh, where you know he he'd be safe and protect his brand, um, and just kind of focus on uh, the commodity of basketball. Having said that, Dr. Scott, I want to ask you about two athletes in particular who stand out when we talk about um, uh, both serving in that role model role, but then also bucking the system. And they are um, Jack Johnson and Joe Lewis. Tony, I know you played the game, and you talk about all the people that came before you that kind of laid the foundation for you but you were also a trailblazer in that sense. So I want to begin with you, Dr. Scott, just to kind of share with us why those two gentlemen in particular are so important in the moments in which they competed and in the world in which they live. And then Tony, if after Dr. Scott's done, you can share, because you do have a little bit of element in this, this in your story too, that even with the increase in the number of black athletes, you're always a trailblazer in some sense when you're a person of color playing um, in a professional sport. We'll begin with you, Dr. Scott. Absolutely. Um, I always have a lot of fun talking about Jack Johnson and Joe Lewis, so I'll try to keep it to a minimum because I could go on and on and on about it. But when we talk about, you mentioned the revolt of the black athlete and that idea that comes from a Sports Illustrated article in 1968. And then Dr. Harry Edwards, whom I spoke about uh, previously, then wrote a book of the same name in 1969. And the questions that circulated in both of those publications were, why are we in a particular revolt at this time? This is because black athletes are revolting against a particular system and it's making white America very uncomfortable, essentially. But then the root of that is, what was it a revolt against? Well, there are overlapping things as to what it's revolting against. They're revolting against the status quo, against the way racial terror in the country and structural inequality. And they're revolting against essentially the kind of athlete that America had started to believe as palatable, a kind of athlete that was necessary to break the color barriers and that still took courage to be that athlete. And in many ways, that athlete was Joe Lewis. And he ran in direct contrast to Jack Johnson. So with these two individuals, you have the first and the second black heavyweight champions of the world. Now that carries a heavy weight. So Jack Johnson becomes heavyweight champion in 1910. He can't even fight white fighters in the US because none of them would fight him. And so he follows the current champion at the time, Tommy Burns to Australia. Burns is offered $30,000, quite a lump sum at the time, and he says, sure, I'll fight him. Jack Johnson wins. Well, when Jack Johnson wins this fight, mind you that boxing at the time was not just a singular sport, it was seen as a contest of manhood. And so when you have a white boxer and a black boxer, then it was white against black. That's how America looked at it. So Jack Johnson wins. There's a call for a great white hope to come out of retirement. And that would be Jim Jeffries because he retired as the champion. He didn't technically lose. So people said, well, he's still champion. Why don't you fight Jack Johnson was the call in the media. We have to put this person in his place. Jack Johnson flaunted his money, which he had a right to do. He dated white women publicly in 1910. He ran against the nerves, essentially, of many in white America. And they wanted to remove him from his throne. Well, what ends up happening is that Jack Johnson beats Jim Jeffries in the fight in Reno, the great fight of the century. And after he beats him, the film is banned from being played across the country. There is a massacre. Whites across the country riot against blacks and kill and hurt a number of black people across the country simply because of this fight. Anti-miscegenation laws are passed around the country because of this singular fight. The fight became black against white. And when black won, white supremacy was reinstated in these various kinds of ways. And so when Joe Lewis becomes heavyweight champion, 
uh, in 19, I think he won in 1936, if I remember correctly, 36, 37. When he becomes heavyweight champion, the idea of his handlers was, we want no semblance of what looked like Jack Johnson. We want an athlete who will be palatable, who will be accepted. He was taught to knock out his opponents rather than risk having anyone judge whether or not he won. He was taught to not gloat when he won. He was taught to be extraordinarily humble. And that, coupled with the fact that he beat an Italian and a German fighter at the same time when the world was about to be engaged in World War II, and it was a fight against Nazism, he became beloved in America. He became the kind of athlete that a lot of white Americans could accept. And so there was a stark difference between Joe Lewis and two black men standing on the podium in 1968 with their fist in the air. That was considered a revolt. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, you know, Dr. Scott, I appreciate every time that we have you on because you bring such a fresh perspective with regard to that. Tony, I want to follow up with you on this question of being a trailblazer because your career in some sense, again, people will assume, you know, all of the, the difficult work had been done. And yet um, you shared with us some experiences that you had that clearly indicated that you were still navigating in a space where you were conquering misconceptions, stereotypes, as you performed on the field and off. Can you talk about why, as we move into this next section of our conversation about the power of the Black athlete, why it's important for people to understand that and to know that? Well, I, you know, it's never easy. And, and I think everyone will look and say, well, you're different. You made it, right? And But nobody ever looks at what, what it took to get there. And from having people call me nigger in high school and suing the state high school league to having people throw bananas on me in fields in Germany and making monkey noises every time an African-American in the stadium would do it to being back in America as a world cup star and a leader. Um, again, when you're, you know, when you're 35 and the scouting report is, well, if you want a big athlete that runs fast, right. Then that's the scouting report and not, you know, going in like the rest of the world where you're seen as a good passer, a skillful person as an intellect. Um, so no matter where you are, we're constantly facing this every day, you know, in, in, in work, um, even how you're perceived, how the media treats you, how sponsors treat you. And like you said, like America will accept you if you're their kind of black person. Um, and so, you know, we, we do have to make that choice. And, and recently, you know, I, I joined a group of African-American men um, and, and, and women. We actually, we decided that it, it was, it was, together, but um, it's called SCORE, Soccer Co Collective on Racial Equity. Um, and we looked around and we said, well, there's more of us than we think, but less of us than there should be. And, you know, even within the game of soccer in this country, you look at all the African-Americans that played in the World Cup with me or the, the highest ranks in the Hall of Fame, and not one um, is coaching in Major League Soccer, not one there's one, I think, that has a GM job in, in Toronto. So, um, you know, no matter how high you go, you know, the ceiling's still there. And um, you are always the first. Um, and you're always the first till things are, 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 are normal. And so we've kind of decided as a collective that we want to make sure that we're there um, sponsoring the players now. Um, as they work with Major League Soccer, and, and you might have heard Black Players for Change, and um, they're a, a great group of pretty much every person of color in Major League Soccer has joined this 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 group. Um, and again, much like the WNBA, they're they're putting everything on the line. And when I'm in meetings with them, I'm 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 so excited because um, you know they almost don't they don't have that fear. Um, and if they do, they don't care. And they're, and they're, they're questioning, they're standing up and they're, they're demanding, um, they're demanding, um, what's right is right. And they're, and they're not. So it's great to be able to support them because, you know, the truth is, is they're putting their careers at risk every day, um, by saying what's right, or if they're not the right kind of black person. So Tony, I'm going to stay with you for a second because you're doing amazing work in a space that is not as visible as some of the other major league sports in the United States. It's not that soccer isn't popular here. It's just that when we think about um, American sports, obviously people think about the NFL, they think about the NBA, 
And yet, when I think about the impact that you're having in terms of mentoring, creating opportunities for um, young women and men of color uh, to um, not only learn the game, be exposed to the game, but to be able to compete um, at the highest level, uh, I'm excited by that. I'm going to ask you a difficult question, but um, and your your life indicates one thing, but it's a it's a larger question for athletes in general. Do athletes have a social responsibility to give back? Black athletes in particular. I believe that we all have a responsibility to give back as leaders. I think those of us that are blessed to be in the position have even a bigger responsibility. So yes, I believe that um, you know God gave us talents and a voice and a platform. And so if we want to be leaders, how we use that platform and talents for good is important and is a responsibility. Um, The fact is that none of us have a choice. And the people that we have the biggest influence on are the people probably closest to us. So unless we want to turn our backs on our families, right, because your little brother is going to follow your path. Unless we want to turn our back on our families, our culture, our country, our origins, um, we have a responsibility. Such a great point. Um, I want to mention to our viewers this afternoon, if you do not follow uh, Tony Santa or Terry and uh, Scott on social media, you should. Uh, Dr. Scott in particular writes extensively um, and tweets about um, not only African-American history, but that athletics. And one of the things that I want to talk to you about now, Dr. Scott, as we make this transition, is the power of the Black athlete, particularly the aversion to. So we saw Charles Barkley, for example, push back against this idea that he had to be a role model. We're now in a moment where athletes seem to be embracing that along with activism. But there is, and you indicated this earlier in talking about LeBron James, um, a discernible pushback against that. Can you uh, share with the audience uh, what you think are the sources of that and how it manifests itself, particularly um, in our in our contemporary moment, the last few years? Absolutely. I think that the source of some of that pushback, um, and I'll talk some about what Mr. Senna was saying about this kind of responsibility as well. The source of some of that pushback is the idea that the black the black body is commodified and owned by the public. And so when people say, I don't want to see the athletes kneeling, I'm spending money on the game as though those individuals who are in opposition to those demonstrations of, um, to those demonstrations somehow own the athlete, own the team and have a vested interest in them rather than, and what it does is it objectifies the athlete and it reduces a particularly black athlete's body to a singular purpose of entertainment. And that is a historical continuum because we see the same kind of criticism over the last 70 years for uh, athletes who have gotten involved in the push for racial justice, social justice. So much of that stems from that. Much of it stems from uh, implicit bias and racism that says, this is what you are supposed to do. And if you do something that offends my sensibilities, then I am in opposition to that. I mean, we can see, for instance, when uh, Laura Ingram from Fox News told LeBron James to, quote unquote, shut up and dribble. And he wonderfully reappropriated that and turned it into a three part miniseries. But then when Drew Brees was talking about his own political stances, she defended him. So this is a very, again, racialized criticism that we see in terms of what then should they do? Um, I really appreciate what Mr. Senna was saying about this kind of responsibility because I believe the same and I also recognize the courage that it requires. And there's something to that. There are different forms of activism. There are different ways to change the world, both small and large. You can create a foundation. You can kneel. You can go on, on broadcast and talk about social injustice. You can also, as Mr. Senna said, mentor. There are ways to use your platform that create a difference in this world. And so I think the key is for individuals to discover that themselves and particularly for young athletes to be able to be mentored by others and older athletes to say, this is the way that you can maneuver and you can use your platform for good. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Tony, I wanna talk to you about something that you're doing that I think is very unique. Uh, You have taken a position, um, commendably, I believe, that in dealing with racism in sports, we can't just focus on what's happening on the field of play. Uh, Particularly for youth, we have to deal with uh, families, we have to deal with fans, we have to deal with parents, we have to deal with coaches. Um, Why have you taken that approach and why do you think that's where we should be headed 
um, particularly now if we want to transform not only sports, but our larger society as a whole. Well, just from a sports perspective, right? Say I want to improve the game of soccer in this country. And we say, why aren't our best <laughs> athletes playing? Traditionally in the rest of the world, um, lower income families play soccer more than any other sport. But because of patriotism, because we created our own sports in America and we made soccer to be anti-American, it, it is now a upper middle class white sport. But we want to compete. And we know every society can't compete without 100% of its citizens, men, women, tall people, short people, black people, white people. Um, these athletes aren't going to compete unless we have an equitable environment. So from a pure soccer perspective, I want to improve the environment so that we're able to compete on a global stage. Um, Barcelona is a team in the world where they say, you know what, we want to build, you know, um, the best team in the world, but we want to build world-class people. Ultimately, in our community, um, sports, I think, has, as Nelson Mandela said, amazing power to connect and change the world. Um, and so it is a place where we can all come together. And if that's not a place where we can be together, and if that is corrupted, and if that is not fixed, um, that is one of the fabrics. That's what the Olympics are supposed to be. You know, wars have stopped because of soccer. So if that can't be pure, if that can't be equitable, then we have no chance in, in, in the rest of the community. So we, we know that a lot of habits are started at home through parents. And I don't want to give let people off the hook, but a lot of behavior is learned. And so sometimes it is ignorance as well. And we can we educate people. Because I believe, by and large, people want to do the right thing. And I think if we educate them, and let them know how they're really making us feel or show them what they're really doing, they're, they're, they'll, be, they'll change. And so I want to provide those opportunities for everyone to be their best selves and educate them so we have a more equitable um, sporting environment. And I hope it transfers over to the rest of our community. I appreciate that, Tony, and certainly appreciate that work. It is um, sorely needed and admirable to be taking that uh, perspective, especially now. I might think about Ibram Kendi's work, How to Be an Anti-Racist Baby, this idea that we have to, as we're thinking about our contemporary generation, also think about um, the, the generation to come and what we're doing to help seed foundations that will make us a stronger society as a result, an anti-racist society. You're certainly doing that work um, in your field, so thank you. Now, I just kind of want to ask you about economics. We've got a ton of questions coming through from the audience. People are really appreciating this conversation. But um, I want to end uh, by asking you a question about the economic impact of the uh, African-American athlete and how that plays into this in terms of amplifying voice, but also creating challenges in terms of those athletes that are seeking to um, be engaged as much as possible on, on questions of social justice. Yeah, I think that the economic impact, um, I think it's something that you mentioned previously when you're talking about the the power of somebody's opposition to something and saying, if I'm not going to play, what kind of money is a group going to lose? And not only what kind of money are they going to lose, but what is that? What kind of attention does that call to uh, what's happening in the world? And so when the Bucks, for instance, decided not to play in one of the games, then that creates a conversation. So not only is there a loss of money on that end, but there creates a new paradigm of understanding, a new expectation. And so athletes are then lending their voices to other voices that were yelling, particularly in this past year, for change. And so we see an economic change and athletes have been a very big part of that because of their visibility. We see a hundred um, top companies that have said that they're going to commit money to making sure that they hire people of color over the next 10 years in higher positions. We have seen companies who are taking a stance and re looking at their own makeup and looking at what they do in communities and being more active in trying to dismantle structural racism. And so athletes' voices are being lent to those calls for change. And much of that, as we know, and as you know very well, it comes from what happened there in your town with uh, the murder, the lynching of George Floyd. And so athletes' voices have been sent and added to the voices of others to make sure that change is on the horizon and much change has happened over the past year. 
Excellent, thank you. We're going to uh, turn to our audience now for some questions and um, allow them to uh, engage in this conversation. And the first question comes from Matt Moberg, who said, I chaplain for the Timberwolves. In our crew, we have a handful of guys who are interested in being more active with their advocacy, but want to be wise with how they do so. As we continue to have conversations about this, what would be the top resources that you'd recommend for us to connect with? It's a great question. Tony, we'll begin with you and then uh, Dr. Scott. Well, I think, um, I mean, I'm just going to be direct here. Um, you know, there are a lot of organizations that, that are willing to, to work with organizations. And we've worked with the Timberwolves and their head of social responsibility used to be here. Um, but the fact is, is that as we partner with people, you know, what, what is truly driven by sponsorship and money? And what is the team's control of the players? Do they really tell the players, hey, go and meet whatever organizations you want or, is, or are things controlled? Um, there are a lot of good organizations in this community. Um, and I think part of what we do, you know, in Athletes for Hope nationally is we try to connect athletes to use their own voice. And this was part of my Bush Fellowship. How do we get athletes to be able to work on their own? Um, as I go into this, you know, athletes used to do appearances. Um, next thing you know, they're going to the hospital to visit some kids. Next thing you know, the team is selling that sponsorship for that hospital village. Next thing you know, the athlete says, well, the team is getting paid for me visiting kids in the hospital. That's a paid appearance, so I want to get paid. Next thing you know, athletes need to be paid for their charity work. Athletes are willing to do work and connect to the community if they know that it's real, if they know it's not somebody else isn't making money and taking advantage of them, if they know it's not being commercialized, right? So teams have to let athletes connect and really organically connect without influence. Like let athletes figure out what they want to do and don't think about how it affects you because it, do it doesn't affect you. It will, your athletes will be happier, your community will be happier, but you got to really be able to connect your athletes to the community with no gain of your own. Because at the end of the day, like we went back, it turns back to money. What do my sponsors want to see? What's best for me? If this is about the athletes, then you got to support them in what is for their personal well-being. Uh, anything to add, uh, Dr. Scott? Yeah, I'd like to talk about, um, if I may, two organizations in particular that I am uh, honored enough and lucky enough to be a part of. One of them I'm a resident historian for. It's called Project Pilgrimage, and it's projectpilgrimage.org, and they take people on uh, journeys, really pilgrimages, not tours, but really kind of life examinations through the South to connect the history of the modern civil rights movement to today and to teach you what you can do. And so that is open for anyone to the public to be able to do that. The other is an organization which I work with, which is called Common Power and it's commonpower.org. And I'm a fellow for that organization. And what they have now done, they teach civic engagement. They have started working with a group of athletes in teaching them how to teach others, how to be involved in whatever kind of move for social justice that person is interested in. And so not telling them what to do, but giving them the tools on how to create a platform for themselves, for those who are unaware of how to do that. So those are two things I would look into. I'm gonna add one myself. I work with the YWCA St. Paul here in Minnesota. Our mission literally is combating racism and empowering women. And I often, um, having been with the Jackie Robinson Foundation and understanding the power of sport, um, you know, you have a lot of athletes who um, want to get more active. There are organizations on the ground that are doing that work. If you could connect the two in a way organically that allows uh, those people who are desirous of doing that activism to be connected to organizations that are having real impact on the ground, that's a win for everybody. And I think sometimes it's just a reminder that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to become better acquainted with what's happening in community and in working community, as both you and Tony have suggested to manifest that in a way that's beneficial to everyone as a whole. Uh, we'll take our next question. Can I just oh, I give it a go right away. I would say Athletes for Hope is it's a national organization that tries to get every athlete together for that purpose as well. And not every athlete, it's easy for me to say because I started my own organization, but has to start their organization. You guys all can be great champions, guys and girls, can all be great champions for a lot of good people doing stuff. So if you go on social media, find something that you believe in, 
call them up and ask them how you can support them. I love that. Go ahead, um, Terry. Yeah, I just wanted to add very quickly too, to anyone who's in a position, um, us as educators, others, you also have the power to teach others how to be more civically engaged. I started an organization that connects, for instance, student athletes to local economically marginalized youth to help mentor them. We all have the power to be able to do that, to learn more um, and to then effectively turn that around and pay it forward and teach others. So as we talk about how can we teach others, let us not forget the power of you, the power of the individual to be able to be that person to help train others. We'll close the loop on this by saying that we often think about athletics and team sports and how they go hand in hand. As people are thinking about ways to have impact, take that same approach. What's the strongest team or the team that could use that power player in your community and then link up with them to help them move the ball forward um, in a particular area that you want to have impact, which is, again, as, as uh, both of you have mentioned, critical um, in terms of the work that we do collectively. We'll take our next question. Um, this is from Audrey. I don't want to mispronounce the last name. How do we start teaching young athletes, especially black and brown from underserved communities, how to balance being advocates while not, uh, while not closing themselves off to opportunities? That's fantastic. Um, who'd like to tackle that first? So I think uh, Tony is pointing to you, Terry. Oh, okay. I thought he was pointing to you, Dr. Williams. So <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and I think it goes back to some of the things that we talked about because closing yourself off to other opportunities is a real backlash to involvement. And unfortunately, the more kind of uh, popular that you are, the higher the price tag on what you do, in some ways you have a little bit more latitude to do things that a free agent, for instance, couldn't do. Or in college, they're often told by their coaches not to do particular things. And so you, you face then these, these students and other athletes a real kind of dilemma, a crossroads, when they want to be able to engage with underserved communities, but they're worried about what somebody may do to them or how that might impact them. I think the key in that is to find good mentors, number one, whether that be if you're in college, a professor whom you trust or relatives who can kind of help one a young athlete navigate that landscape to determine what would be best and to understand that there are different forms of activism, as we've mentioned here throughout, that you can do something that changes the world that doesn't have to be something that you fear may make you lose your scholarship, because that's a real thing too. And you don't want to run the risk of being sidelined and having to leave, for instance, a college scholarship because of something that you've engaged in. You have that option, of course, but I think it's very important to make sure that you have mentors who can help you navigate what you wanna do. That never means don't do anything. I am an advocate, like Mr. Senna said, always do something. It is our responsibility as human beings. It is our responsibility as members of a larger community to engage and to help change our communities and change our world. And I want to just add, like, isn't it a shame? Like, isn't it a shame that when people of color have to worry about what's going to happen if they stand up for what's right? And so I think the best thing we can do is empower them and let them know how incredibly awesome they are. Give them the tools to navigate, pick their goals. Let them understand the real sacrifice that they may or not have to make so they can make those decisions on their own. You know, Muhammad Ali knew exactly what he was doing, knew the risk, and he chose to do them. I think the best thing we could do is educate our young black and brown children and let them know the opportunities and the risks involved, and then they can choose what they want to do. At the end of the day, we don't want regrets. And so we want people making decisions with the best information so that they sleep well at night. I'm going to add very briefly to that before we take our next question. Pat Bagley did a phenomenal cartoon. I'm in the aftermath of Muhammad Ali's passing. And he said, Ali was the greatest, not because he was the champion, but because he was always the challenger. I love that because in the idea of challenging, it doesn't always have to be that I'm out front, um, you know, at, at the front of a protest. And that's important and we celebrate that, but there are other less visible forms of advocacy, of activism that are deeply impactful that we don't know about sometimes. You know, one of the things that I loved about Jackie Robinson is that he was a great champion of other athletes in other sports. It's an aspect of his career that we don't hear a lot about, but he supported 
golfers and tennis players. And um, Joe Lewis did the same thing for him. Um, that's a form of activism. That's a form of advocacy. That's living humbly for justice. You need both, as, as Dr. Scott said earlier. Um, it's the tapestry um, and the web of activism that ultimately helps to produce change. Not everyone has to operate in the same, um, same arena. So uh, we'll take our next question. I think we have, I'm actually gonna take both of the next two questions just so we can get these in in our last five minutes. Megan Evans asks, kids who identify as transgender are being legally excluded from participating in athletic programs. Can you talk a little bit about black athletes who identify as LBGTQ and historical and contemporary challenges? And if we could put that next question up, um, please, because I just wanna try to get both of these in before we go, they're both great questions. Um, what can fans do to lift up support athletes who are standing up to racial justice? So let's take those two in the last five minutes that we, in the last few minutes that we have left. Who'd like to begin? Could you guys keep both questions up? And which one do we answer first? Your choice. They're both great questions. The first is on, you know, how do we support, do we know of, um, uh, can we talk a little bit about black athletes who also identify as LBGTQ and the historical and contemporary challenges and um, helping young people understand that? I mean, I, I, I'm just gonna be honest. Um, you know, it's it's an area that we're always exploring, everyone. And, you know, we work globally on, on, with Project Play to design um, curriculum for the LGBTQ community in, in the sport of soccer, um, because we know it's an area um, of opportunity, of growth that we need to do better in. So, you know, we try to support um, our staff and we, we have staff that that, um, that that demographic and um, all we can do is be supportive, but we constantly have to push ourselves. And I think the fact that, you know, if we're searching for answers to this, it means that we're not giving enough attention um, and we need to be able to do better. Um, and, and so that we have, you know, right, like we should, especially someone in my position, should be able to rattle off, you know, six solutions and support system, which we don't have, which tells me as an organization that I need to do better. And I need to make bigger investments um, in these areas so that we can support people better. Um, currently, when we do training, um, whether it's anti-racism training, um, gender identity training, um, um, when we talk about racism in those areas, we do try to support individuals and help people report, respond, and resist, you know, what we what we consider racist behavior um, and empower people, be proud of who they are, um, and give them the support they need to, to succeed. And I think I'll, I'll add to that, and that's very well stated. I'll add to that, that historically, if we talk about the challenges historically versus what we have going on today in our contemporary society, we can add a fourth consciousness. So when I've talked about a three, a triple consciousness, a fourth consciousness of, um, of sexuality, of, of gender identity. And so African-American athletes who have also identified as LGBTQ plus historically have had to cover up their identities, much like their white counterparts because of a nation that was so highly homophobic, a country that was willing to kill people who were members of LGBT community. So I think of Ora Washington, for instance, who was a famous black star in the 1930s. She was both a tennis player and um, a basketball player and had to cover up her own sexuality because of the way that America would reject her. Most recently, the WNBA, various players within the WNBA, both black and white of note, have said that when they have engaged in the work of speaking up against social justice and speaking up against uh, racial injustice, rather, that they have been criticized not only because of the way that other athletes have been criticized for stepping outside of their so-called space, but they have also said it's because we're too black and we're too queer. And so they recognize that some of the criticism that is heaped upon them is because there are a large number of queer women in the WNBA. That demonstrates that we still have work to do, that because they are being criticized for their sexuality, that is a problem and that is a space where we have work as a country to do. And I think it speaks to the, the next question that came up, how do, I, how do we um, support 
right? Athletes who are standing up to racial justice. We support them by recognizing them as full human beings who have a shared experience that has pushed them to that part. We don't expect them to say, oh, when I watched George Floyd be lynched, that has nothing to do with me. When I watched Ahmaud Arbery be lynched, I can separate who I am as a black person from that incident. No, they can't. That kind of pain impacts people across the country, but it impacts people of color in a particular way. And we must all recognize that and athletes are not somehow buffered from that pain. I wanna thank you. I think both of our guests today, Tony Senna and uh, Dr. Terry Ann Scott, thank you for your contributions. I wanna remind everyone that um, the next uh, Black History, Black Voices program, Racism and Minnesota's Progressive Illusion, uh, will take place on Wednesday, May 19th at 7 p.m. And in the meantime, I wanna remind all of you to be safe and we will see you the next time we're all together. Take care.